You're on. Simon. Oh, I nearly said it again. Don't do it again. I nearly said it again. We're past that. You should know okay. now. Okay. For people, yeah, I, yeah, for people not wondering, I did an exclusive patron interview with uh, Simon Town. And I did Thank not you. refer to him as Simon Town. It was someone else's nickname. I don't know. Right? No, it's someone else's surname. Anyway, Simon Town, Quick Draw Card Company. Welcome to the HR Studio. Thank you so much. Pleasure hey. to be here. Mega to have you here. I mate. never thought I was going to be here. I've followed you for a while. And uh, I always see these glamorous guests come on. And I thought, nah, you ain't going to have me on there. Never. <laughs> now look. Standards have dropped well, you. We've been look talking about it for a while, haven't we? What's that? Um, yes. Yeah, Ages. we have. Yeah. I think because we, we, you wanted to put it off at one point. Because there was some stuff in the pipeline, mm, which you, I'm sure we'll get to. Uh, yeah, but tell I me can't. Yeah, I, I mean, we can talk about it, but I can't drop names because NDAs and all sorts. Well, I don't want to get into trouble. But never mind that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't worry about. It. Tell me about the Stephen Hawking documentary you mentioned just now. Um, okay, so the time was 2015, and uh, I uh, so after I left the military, I started. Uh, I sort of dabbled around. Uh, inside the job that I was working, doing some extra work. And I know there's going to be 95% of guys out there who uh, who used to be in the military have probably dabbled in it every now and again. There's only one or two companies that do it. So um, luckily, I was doing CP in London at the time, and one of my uh, good friends that I worked with, he um, he actually knew the owner of the, the company that was running, that ran the extras sort of stuff. Do you want, and, to, mention, um, do you want to mention the company? Uh, yeah, Military Film Services. Um, did they, did they but I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen anything from them for a while, so I don't know. But did they not become services to film? I don't know. Like, I, I, I haven't worked or done anything with them since this. So I this is like five became, years ago. I think they became services to film. Was a guy called Dickie Tran running it? No. Um, um, I, 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 I can't, be wrong then. I can't think. Sorry, like I said, there's Sorry. only a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's only a couple of them, so uh, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure. Anyway, so I got um, we got the email come through. Every now and again, you get an email come through, and it goes job on. Pay this, set rate, use, this is what you need to do. But one of them came out and it was um, Sniper needed for a documentary. And I was like, ah, oh, this is probably the first time that anything's come up where I'm like, okay, I, this, is, this is, sounds all right. And there's not going to be that many people. Anyway, I was actually sat next to my friend Dave on shift when it came through. And he's like, have you just seen that email come through? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, do you want me to, do you want me to message him to use you? And I'm like, yeah. And uh, so he messaged him two days later. Uh, uh, Andy Buckley, that's his name. Um, he got um, so I had a chat with Andy, and he was he wanted a CV of what I've done um, within the Marines and shooting and this that and the other, and he wanted a picture as well. So he's like, you know, it's going to be on TV, and he don't want you looking like a you know bag of shit or anything. So I was like, okay, cool. Um, so I got that sent over to him. And he's like, yeah, cool. The only problem is I didn't have a rifle, so I met. I I actually spoke to one of the armourers who was going to come with me on the shoot. So it was, at, it was at Diggle Range in Wigan. How come they weren't supplying it for you, the production company? Well, no. So they they could, but it was a rifle that I'd never used before. Oh. It was, um, I can't even remember what it was. It was a 7.62 rifle. Um, and because the armourers, they only have, they don't really have that big variety of bolt action rifles. So I, <laughs> a couple of years before when I was on a sniper training team, me and the team went down to Accuracy International Factory in Portsmouth. And we actually got to have a look around. Um, you know, made some friends, those guys down there who was the reps, and uh, I rung them, and I was like, hey, it's Cy here, I used to be on the Royal Marine Sniper training team, how's it going, this, that, and the other. Anyway, um, any chance I could borrow one of your free free eights? And they're like, why? I'm like, because um, I'm, I'm going to do some filming on a Stephen Hawkins documentary, and uh, they were like, yes, what do you want? When do you want it? And I was like, um, just just do me a normal standard, as we used to use, L113A5, you know, Schmidt Bendoscope, all the full works. And they're like, cool, where do you want it? Um, and they, they delivered it to the armorer who was working for the production company and uh, drops off some ammunition. They're like, cool, yeah, just take it, just bring it back whenever you're finished. Was that Frank? Who helped Frank Fletcher, yeah, 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 it was Frank, yeah. So, um, so yeah, Frank, Frank delivered a rifle. Um, and then we went up there and we were, so the whole idea for the thing was, have you ever heard of a company called Tracking Point, which is um, an American company and they basically made these scopes that had jet fighter tracking technology in them. So it works out, so you push this little red button on your target and it works out the bullet drop and everything like that and then all you have to account for is wind. So if your wind calls fine, you should technically hit every single time. But they wanted to do it where they put it to the test and it, it's, it is 
it's really Chad. Um, they were like, it's sniper versus science. So they wanted me to work everything out myself. <coughs> and then they wanted the track and point rifle was going to have a shoot off to see who would be better. Like, is it, is it really bad that you can buy a rifle like this if you can, sh if you don't need any experience to? So they wanted to sort of put that to the test. But from a, from a, I mean, it was all right, but from a production point of view, I said to them, so this is a new rifle. I've never shot it before. I've got no data for it. And I was like, just at least get me on a hundred, just at least get me a zero. That's all I want. And they're like, yeah, yeah, don't worry, don't worry. And then the next thing, the guy's like, right, we're going to move back to 500 meters. I'm like, okay. So the only data I had was from shooting at Barry Budden five years before, <laughs> <laughs> which I had in my loft still. So I had my data card there and I was like, I'm just going to have to massively cuff this. Um, so we went back there and then I had to do this piece where I had to... Uh, the guy's name Jim his was he's um he's he's done a few like I had no idea who he was until I met him and he's done loads of scientific documentaries like Brian Cox's Bezzy Oppo basically um so I had to do a bit where I had to teach him how to shoot um but when I was teaching him how to shoot and he was shooting I was secretly gathering data because I knew we was going to go back further and it was all going to get filmed so I didn't want to look like a complete tip um so he done that we shot there I'm making notes. And then at the end, he's like, okay, we're going to do a shoot off. Um, so Jim's going to be shooting a tracking point. You're going to be shooting your rifle at 1,000 meters. And we're going to have balloons at the butts. And I'm like, wow, okay. And uh, me and Jason, who was the CEO of Tracking Point, American guy, he was there as well on a day. And we both looked to each other and we're like, okay, let's, let's try it. I can't guarantee it's going to be anything good because I got, like I said, I've got nothing. I haven't even got a zero. So let's do it. So we went back to 1,000 meters. We filmed it. And um, I got really lucky. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, I got really, really lucky. And with those six balloons, I shot five out of the six with 12 rounds. And then he only shot three out of the six, I think. So, you know, on paper, I beat him. And it proved that a trained sniper is more effective than the technology that comes with it, all these fancy this, that, and the other. Uh, but it was good, you know. It was really good. If you had been up to, if you had, had like a sight back and all that, it would have been a whitewash. It would have been fucking, you know. If you had the advantage of having the sight well, this back is and it. all the data, it would have been like fucking yeah. probably six. Well, six rounds. I'd, six I'd like to think balloons aren't a small target. It's a head. Really. It's a headshot it's at a grand. Cool. It's headshot at grand. But uh, so, um, yeah. but it was good. It was really good. That rifle is a bit of kit. It's insane. It's so good. Like the picture, and you got an iPad. So what they wanted what, to the do? The tracking point rifle. Yeah, the tracking point rifle. has got this. It's got built-in Wi-Fi that you get an iPad with and what they wanted to use it and I can understand what they're doing they wanted to try and get them out to the U the US SF lads and um, their, their idea from a sniper perspective was to give um, a sniper pair look, imagine four sniper pairs a rifle each and then the, the commander sits at the back with the iPad and he's got all four scopes on his iPad and he can conduct a coordinated shoot from his iPad onto the lads shooting down which makes sense I think it's, that's a really fancy but you know, when you're out on ops, you know, you've got batteries and this, that, and the other. And does it, would it work? I don't know. But um, the idea was that I think they're still good. They bought out AR variants with the scopes and all this, that, and the other. But um, yeah, on that day, it was really cool. It was a good little gig, really. Yeah. Um, no, it's fun. Ali. Yeah, Ali stuff. I, when I went to, um, I about the side park. I don't, people don't really understand that. This, this, people aren't trained. No. Even just in shooting, not new snipers, but yep. like you fucking busy people. Unless you're one of those, don't yeah. understand the value of the sight park. I remember we were in Kandahar, right? And the second time we went out, oh, God. and we got there. One month with one month fives. Oh, we had LA, LA yeah, yeah. as well. Okay. And um, we got put down on the range. Is have you been to Kandahar? Um, only passing through. Right. So the range is there. Well, we got there. Got put, sent down there to go and get prepped for going out on, on the ops. Because we going out and doing. Um, uh, uh, grabbing high, mm -hmm. high, high valley targets throughout mm -hmm. that tour. So in and out, in and out, in and out. Yeah. Do you know what range Kandahar's got? With thousands of thousands uh, of US military, mate. Thousands of US military. I don't know. Twenty-five meter range. Brilliant. To anyone, <laughs> and they expected the sniper yeah. platoon to go down there. Yeah. Do a twenty-five meter range, which you can't even fucking zero no. one one five. No, you can't. You can't it's impossible. You can't do anything. No. Um, and then go out and start dropping people first round. Yeah, like, no, it's, not, it's never going to happen. It's not going to work. Like no, of course that. not. It's not going to work like that. No, we're going to need to get on the ground and then do an, and then do some form of sight back if we can uh, some somehow. Yeah. If not even a sight back, 
One hundred meters, just let a zero hundred meters. Yeah, fucking ridiculous. I mean, right? it's it's probably a bit naughty, but um, we was in a very si- similar situation in Afghan in two thousand and ten, where we didn't really have that time, but we was um, we was in an over OP for three and a half months, and um, you know, every morning at five thirty, when those speakers blaring out that music and waking us up, it, you know, it does grind you down a bit. So we did a bit of data collection on the speakers um, <laughs> uh, just to check. Just to check that the zero was in, and uh, you know it it, it worked. Um, it's it's a bit naughty, but Jesus Christ! Once you're doing you know six on nine off for three and a half months on sentry duty, that shit wears you down very quickly. Um. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, was that, that you did six on nine off for three months? Yeah, yeah. Oh God! And it, hot summer, so even when you do the, the graveyard shift and you get off at six a.m. or whatever it was, trying to get your head down and it's forty-five degrees, no aircon, no fresh rations. Um, we was on ten man rats for you know two months. Um, it was pretty pretty grim to be fair. Fun, loved it, but it was hard work, really hard yeah, work. I think the closest thing I did to that was one on one on four off for three weeks. It was only for three weeks. So yeah, yeah. One on four off. But but it was, like, there was only five of us where we were. Same with those. Yeah, yeah. So we was in we was in slap bang middle of um, Sangin in a in an old Taliban commander's house. <laughs> called tea house that's what it was called the 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 pb and uh, there was only five of us there um we had a a troop of a and a downstairs um so you know it got it got really loud but it was like um the whole thing had been bombed the jdam hit it the year before so there was like nothing left of it so we <coughs> the the rifles who we took over from who had before made like an improvised sort of tower and um yeah we 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 sort of made the best of what we had, but it was horrible. And then, you know, tensions. And it was at that time there when we... There was quite a lot of uh, green on blues there at that time, wasn't there? Terrible. Yeah. That's what I was just about to say. The AMP had opened up just up the road on a load of guys. And um, tensions were very, very high. And especially when there's five of us and there's a whole team of A&A downstairs... And like the Terp that was in charge of them hated our guts as well, and we was like, "Oh no, we don't need." Wasn't this. that the year that the Welsh Guard CEO got brassed up? I think it was. That yeah. was that year, wasn't it? Yeah. A bunch of them, and he was one of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It turned everything in the AO. Not even us. Everywhere, all over. It, it that turned really quickly, and it was bad for a good couple of months until we had to sort of play their game, you know, be nicey nicey, and try to sort of, you know, because it was all back in those days. Courageous restraint, hearts and minds. That was the aim of the game. Not even with just people that lived in Afghan where you used to go out and patrol. It was trying to keep them lot happy as well because, you know, no one knows what was going to happen. They could turn it. We would have been, we wouldn't, there's no way we would have survived that if they'd turned on us. No chance. Um, so we were just trying to play the game, be nicey nicey, and hope we all don't get killed, basically. How does it make you feel with us pulling out there now? Or oh, everyone pulling out of Afghan now? <sighs> I mean, I watched a video on Facebook probably two and a half, three years ago of Sangin Bazaar and the whole thing was at rubble. The whole place, the whole one kilometre stretch of the bazaar was in rubble. Um, Nothing left there, no standing structures. And we went up and down that bazaar, thriving, motorbike shops, butchers, fish, clothing. When you were there. When we were there, everything. It was good, good vibes, you know? There was nothing naughty going on that we knew. Everyone seemed happy. And then I watched this video. We pulled out and left it to the Americans. So the USMC took over from us when we ripped out on Herrick 12. And uh, like literally two years. So maybe a few years after that, um, I watched the video and the whole place was just rubble. And it makes you think, it's like, what was the point? You know? What, what you know? Obviously, it's gone back into the Taliban ha- Taliban's hands. Everything's been bombed and blown up. Everyone's moved out and gone. And it was like, okay, so what? I, d- I don't quite understand what we achieved, really, by being there. Do you? What did we achieve? Is this deep? Do we not? Do we not? Do we not? <laughs> I asked the there? questions around you. <laughs> I know, but you gave me that look as if to say, "Oh." But I'm on your. I'm on your perspective, uh, on mate. It. Well, there's two. Like I go, I go through things. Two different looks at it in my head. One is, I want to validate my time there. Yeah, and the people who didn't come back, their time there. Yeah. But also, I want to look at it objectively, which can be dangerous if you're trying to it does. achieve validation. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. Um, I did an interview for BBC Wales last week, and they're doing a documentary on Welsh 
Welsh um, Welsh guys who served in Afghan. Uh, and I didn't enjoy it. No. I didn't enjoy it. One, because I don't like being your side of the mic where you are now. Yeah. I prefer to be in control, but yeah. it's... And they're asking difficult questions. I'm a bit worried about how that one's going to go, actually, because I got a feeling that the narrative is going to be we shouldn't have bothered going. And then I'm part of that documentary then, which I'd not, I haven't necessarily... No, no, no. My no, I that. get it. Yeah. I made a mistake, actually. I signed, I, I signed the... I signed the... Um, oh, God. The paperwork, giving them authorization to use all the footage. I've signed it there and then. But in the heart, I hindsight, I should have... If you can, I should have waited to say, I want to see this finished product. Yeah. And then I'll let you know if you can yeah. use it or not. But I don't think you'll let you get away with that. Anyway, we'll see. We'll see. That um, it's a very tricky subject. Even when you bring it up with anyone, even lads, they're all like, oh, you know, it's a tough one. It's a tough one to get deep into. Well, there's the question. Is it better off than now than what it was before? And there's a fucking easy answer to that, I yeah. think. Is it, is it obviously better off than what it was before? And I think, I think the answer to that is no. Yeah. But then, you know, you were talking about when we did the Patreon interview, bigger picture. Yeah. We were talking. In reality, we were looking at operational level, campaign level. That is still pretty low down yeah. on the bigger picture strategy, mm-hmm. long-term strategy of the countries. Yeah. Flipping hemispheres. <laughs> yeah. Go for, you know. So what did it achieve in the long run? Don't know. Would as w- was as being there part of a bigger political, um, a military, oh, what's the word, um, uh, posturing to do with China, Russia at the time? That he just, you know, don't know. But you know, as I always say, that's way above my pay grade. <laughs> way above my pay grade. Um, you know, I uh, I got told I just got paid to do what I'm told, and um, that's it. So, you know. I don't want to get too political on that one because I don't want to say anything that. No, no, it's all right, mate. It's all right. <laughs> um, talk to me about the uh, Royal Marine Sniper course. Is that the same one that's run at? Is it the same as the one that run at HDPRCC? Nine weeks. No, nope. oh, we we on. are we are self. So I believe now, from my knowledge, that there's three. I mean, is it the same? Is it the same structure? I mean, mm, sort of. I know the chief instructor of it is a boot neck. Yeah, because well, yeah. Um, we we have our own course at Limpston, which used to be nine weeks, but it's been increased to fourteen now. Okay. Um, and I believe Paras and Guards do their own one at Purbright. Yeah, but it's headed by a bootneck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, it has uh, there was a one point where it wasn't headed by a bootneck? Yeah. I remember. But I'm I'm anyway. pretty I'm pretty sure it is. And then you've got the Brecon course, which is all the other regiments, army regiments. They go down there and do a bit of a. There is that though, right? A, you know what I mean? <laughs> There, there is that, but I think. Do you do you know why that got brought back in? If that is still the case, that is there. Do you know why that got brought? Because it didn't used to be. It used to be HDPRCC would run their courses for Hazard Division Parachute Regiment. Yeah. Right. You guys had your course in Limston. Yeah. And then other units could run their own courses. It's bite, mate, it's... mate. Some of the stories I heard. Yeah. There was there was one. It was because they had. They, I mean, what is it? It's, I don't want to name any regiments, but there was a. I remember there was one unit, and this is this is like the the final the straw that broke the camel's back. In right, we are essential. Everyone has to do a centralized course now. Right. You can't just do your own yep. in-house yeah, courses yeah, yeah. anymore because you're fucking bluffing. Yeah, there was a there was a platoon, uh, a slight platoon commander, officer, maybe a senior NCO. I don't know. And he got they were going on they were going out to Belize, not Belize. They were going out somewhere jungle training. Yeah. And the CO turned around to him and told the told him that he wanted to double the size of the platoon. Um, by the time he came back from jungle training, uh, from ready for Afghan or something like that. Um, no ammunition, so he got given no ammunition. There was no, there was there was basically nothing. They went so he, had, he and he didn't want to do it, and he ended up going to Belize. And basically, if he didn't do this, he's gonna get fucking wasn't look very good for him. Okay. So he came back from came back from Belize or wherever it was with like a, a sniper platoon that had doubled in size. None of them could shoot. Brilliant. That he was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what? <I don't. laughs> That's stopping. Because Brecon just used to be the sniper session commander's course. That's all I used to go from there. Okay. And there might have been some sniper courses there, but I don't know. But it was way ages ago. Yeah, I mean, it was always referred to as all the mess tin regiments sniper course that used to go there and, and do their, you know. Uh, I, I just know that the the... The percentage-wise pass mark was a hell of a lot lower. They may have tried to simulate the shoots and this, that, and the other, but I just know the pass mark was way, way lower than 
ours, yours, anything like that. It was just, yeah, I don't really see the point of it, but I suppose they have to give them. But then giving that title when you've got lads walking around saying, oh, sniper this, sniper that, and it's like, well, you know, you could shoot, but are you that good? Are you though? I don't know, either way. Um, in, well, saying that, me and um, I, I went on and done... I entered the Tri Service Sniper Championships at Bisley in 2012, and it was it was quite weird in the sense that when I was on the team in Puzzle Palace, we got our sniper office upstairs in Puzzle Palace, and downstairs we've got the combat marksmanship team, and they actually passed a bit of paper through our door and was like, "So the army is holding this sniper competition. Does anyone want to enter it?" And the lads looked at it, and I was I was the marine on the team. Everyone else had proper jobs in, and Chris who is my chief instructor yeah <laughs> I was just the jack of all you know do what I'm told and uh, they were like "Sorry, do you want to go and do it but you need to find a, a a second you need to find a number two and I was like okay so I asked any of the lads does anyone want to do it nah we're too busy we're too busy I'm like okay cool um, so I, I rung my mate Mikey Horrocks who was who was on my course oh, I know that hot dog Mikey the hot dog Horrocks is such a legend of a bloke um, we was on the same course together and I was like, Mikey, what are you doing in a couple of weeks' time? Do you want to do you want to come and shoot a competition with me? He's like, Yeah, I'll come and do it. And he used to work in MT, so he's like, Don't worry, I'll get us a vehicle, uh, I'll get us a wagon. Um, good, got you know, got two, went into the armory and got two of the best rifles that we could find in the armory that we had. New barrels, hardly been shot through. This, that, and the other. Um, we'd done two weeks shooting up at Barry Budden. Me and Mikey just just drilling. That's all we were doing, just drilling and drilling. And we, unknown to us, we turned up at Bisley, me and Mikey, um, as a bit of a cuff. We didn't really know what to expect. But we d there was 32, so there was, no, there was 18 other teams there, sniper pairs, from all regiments of the British Army and the RAF Reg as well. And uh, we didn't know that every one of those had to have an in-house competition to get to Bisley. So they had an in-house sniper competition between themselves so welsh this and this that and the other they they'd shot in-house and then the top two in-house got to shoot a bisley representing their regiment which was a bit weird so you had master snipers like color stripes there and this that and the other like some people that have been doing it for a long time and me and mikey rock out and we're like Fuck. like we've only we've done two weeks on the range a bit of buckshee shooting um, and then these Raf Reg lads were the same. But then it was like, it was titled as an army shooting competition. And we're like, well, why the hell are we here? And why is the Raf Reg here? Oh, well, you know, we thought we'd give it. But if you do win, you can't win any trophies. <laughs> That's Jen what they said. So they're like, they said, you can enter and you can win, but you're not eligible to win any trophies. So this is the God's honest truth of what happened. Me and Mikey went there, so it split into two days. First day was short, second day was long. Starting at 300 meters and then finishing at 1,000. Is it only shooting? It wasn't only shooting, shooting. Yeah, yeah. okay. Now, how hard is it to shoot? Like, it's a bit of a nause, isn't it? To shoot in a ghillie suit. Like, if it's windy and you've got shit flying around. So all these lads were wearing ghillie suit. I'm like, lads, this is a marksmanship competition. Some bloke had his rifle fully wrapped in Hessian. And I'm like, and it was pissing down as well, which made that even heavier. <laughs> so we're sat there and we're like, okay, this is, a sh this is a shooting competition. So me and Mike are clean fatigue, no webbing, nothing. We want to be as comfortable as we can. Uh, and we shoot, we shoot the short range, really good. After the first day, me and Mikey were top as a pair and Mikey was top on the individuals. Um, so going into day two, um, we shot long and um, all really good, but you didn't really know because people down the butts, they didn't really want to tell you. You never got, a, you know, butts go down, come back up with a red marker. Uh, None of that. Uh. They stayed up. You shot, and it was within your number two to find out where your shot was, drops this, that, and the other. So, which was all right. I kind of enjoyed that because you didn't really know what was going to happen. So it wasn't until the end of the competition, we're all sat in the artist bar in um, Bisley, you know, like the Hereford bar that they got there. And we're sat there, and there's all these trophies, two big, massive trophies, shields. The whole shebang on this table. Every every sniper's sat in this room. There's 35 of us or so, and they're like, "Okay, so um, <laughs> the award for um, best short range uh, Marine Horrocks Royal Marines." We was like, "Yeah, perfect." Everyone gives a clap. Everyone clap. So best short, um, best short pair um, Royal Marines. So me and Mikey stand back up again in front of all the army lads. <laughs> Claps start getting a little bit longer. Um, going into day two. Um, best long range was Marine Town. 
every half the claps had stopped. <laughs> um, and then best team at uh, long range Royal Marines. And then I, unbeknown to me, won the entire competition. So I stood up and I got a pair of Leopold binos, right? Second place was the Raf Reg lad. So then me, Mikey, and the two Raf Reg lads left after taking all of their prizes and went and got on it at a bar. They shut the door and then they held their official presentation oh, for the best army sniper who actually came third and wasn't the best in that instant. And they got given trophies, all this shields and stuff like that. And we're just like, why are we here? What what was the point in that? Because if anything, we've just caused the noise by coming here and just you yeah, know. they're clicky. I never went to one of those. Sure, they're, they're clicky things, and they are. And in all, in all, I think you be careful what I say here. It's it's not open to everyone. No, I don't know why we got an invite. Uh, it's fucking mad. Yeah, it's mad. But this sniper world's fucking clicky, mate. It is. Jesus I think Christ. Really, yeah. And the, and the variation between between te- well you know obviously the variation between teams and fucking units abilities it varies year by year yeah fucking tour by tour yeah team by team individual by individual yeah. and I found that when I was serving and doing it the which doesn't ring true f- for you guys it's different for you guys but the ones that were least willing to go and compete with other people and challenge themselves with other people yeah. were, the, were the worst. Were the worst. Were the worst. They just, you need to, um, you, you need to expose yourself to other people and other abilities yeah. to understand what you say. Of course it, you It's do. like, it's the old competition is, is good, right? Yeah. Simple fact, I, I never went on any of that. We did, with the big stuff, it was fucking time. Yeah. It's time. Time to prepare and time to go on it. Yeah. It's just, and you just didn't get allowed to go and do stuff like that. No. But we, we did do some symposiums and stuff um, but we we find that no one else would turn up, so right. we did the last one I did. It was supposed to be six different units rock up, and it was, it was um, HD, it was household division. Yeah. Uh, so two power put a team in, three power put a team in. There's only four or five other units turn up. Yeah. Didn't fucking bother. Didn't bother. Yeah. It's I like, didn't get it. No. I, I enjoyed it. myself. Good, I was fun. Good. Good, good fun. It was really and good that, fun. That, was, that symposium, that last one I did, that was everything. It was like stalking. Yeah. It was everything. It was yeah. Fucking quality. No. Fucking hard I, mind. Yeah. Um, the shoots were hard. They were really hard shoots, and because you never got any feedback, it was, it was always hard. It's always easy to lay on the range, and you get it, you get it back. But there, being in like a competition environment and not getting any feedback, and just having to trust what you and whoever you're with are doing is right, um, it pays off much more when you get the results back. You're like, okay, what we're actually doing was actually pretty good. But we kept ourselves to ourselves. We, like I said, it was a bit weird. The whole competition was a little bit strange, and we sort of just kept ourselves to ourselves. Went there. Got our watches, got our binos, and then got on it. Can you imagine being the winner of that best shot trophy, knowing you came third? Can you imagine that? It's exactly Can what I thought. As soon as I walked out the door I and I saw the paperwork and it saw Royal Marines, Raf Reg, um, I was like, <laughs> I didn't even see who came third. So that guy who came third has got to pick a trophy up when he didn't actually win. And it's like, if you didn't want us to win, why invite us? And why invite the Raf Reg there as well? Pointless. Odd. But either way, it was good. It was good fun. It got written on my roars at the end when I left the Marines that I apparently I entered an international sniper championship <laughs> and I won it. So I was like, I'll keep, I'll take that. Don't worry about that. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to change. It. You know, yeah. it's good. It was good fun. It was yeah. good. When, um, when did you get out? So I left at the end of 2012. I jumped on the, uh, I jumped on the uh, security bandwagon. You know, I was the sheep. You know. So I'm, was I. I did that too. Yeah. 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 I done I done the maritime for six seven months, East and West Africa, and then uh, yeah yeah. Is that a sarcastic boast, then was it? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, only because I think we were genuinely one of the first companies that I worked for. I don't even think they're still around now. Um, that worked out on West Africa off the coast of Togo doing ship to ship stuff. It was gash. It was two man unarmed stuff. Bit moody. Pretty gash. Didn't, I'd literally done two jobs and that was it. I was like, no, nah, I ain't doing that no more. After I got stopped in Togo Airport with my winning binos that I'd won in the competition <laughs> um, because I was trying to help the guy out write up some sort of man, uh, marksmanship manual for the lads. Um, got stopped at Togo Airport on my own and um, got called into the back room and interrogated by about seven French officials. Made me sign loads of paperwork that was all written in French and obviously I don't know any French. 
Uh, I was in there about an hour, and they took my binos. They wanted my. They thought I was some sort of government spy, and I bought my binoculars out here because they had a they had a milled up reticule in the in the lens. They're really Gucci, and um, they thought I was using it to plan something. I'm like, <laughs> this is ridiculous. But I could see what they wanted. They just wanted the binos. They were nice and new and shiny. I was like, take take them. Just let me go. Just take them. Sign the paperwork. And just let me go. Never went back. That was my last ever maritime security job ever. Because as we know, you know. The, the higher up aren't going to, you know, try and reimburse you or help you out in any way with that. So it all got denied, and I was like, nah, I'm done. I'm done. What are you going, what are you going to do? What were you going to do then? What was it like realising that uh, that wasn't the career you're going to go and spend all your years and make loads of money in? Because that's what a lot of people think when they go Well, they still do it. do it now. It amazes me that guys are still doing it. But because, but because they don't... You, when you're in, you don't really know any better. And when, it, and when it, it's very rare, I think, for... It, it, <clears throat> I think especially early on when you leave, I think it's very rare for someone who gets out, they go on the circuit, to, to give an honest representation of what that job is really like to someone who's in is asking. Yeah. Because they don't want to say, it's shit. I think for most people, they don't want to say, it's shit, don't bother, mate. Because they don't want to make out that they failed on getting out yeah, and yeah. they should have got back in. I'm talking yeah. early, you know, yeah, months yeah, of yeah. getting out. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. So you, it's hard to get the ground truth when you're in. Yeah. Plus, anything seems better when you're in and you're thinking about leaving. Anything seems better. Yeah. Especially when you get told... Oh, you can make I don't know what. When I was when I went out to do it, it was two, three, four hundred pound a day sterling. Yeah, yeah. Before that, it was even fucking more. I know. Now, you, you earn more as a labourer on a building yeah. site. You genuinely yeah. do. Yeah, it's terrible. And it, and then you, you it all went from the four man British teams to one TL, three local nationals, and then went down again and down again. I was like, no. Nah. But I, very rare. Don't get me wrong. There's not a lot of people still doing it. But there is still the one or two that I see floating around that are still still working it, still doing it. I'm like, sod that, man. I think because the longer you, the, I think the longer you stay doing it, the harder it is to get back and do a normal job. Maybe yeah. Become so it just it, oh. yeah. And it's you know what? It's very similar to serving. It's really routine. Yeah. Well, not the maritime stuff, mate. Well, yeah, the maritime stuff too. But I did you know I did it onshore. I did. CPPSD work in inverted commas in, in Iraq. Yeah, but it's it's very routine. Well, like the three on, two off, or whatever. The eight weeks on, four yeah. we, eight eight weeks on for three, yeah. three and a half off. Yeah, but it's very routine. You're in a military environment. It's it's just it's comfortable. Yeah, I fucking enjoyed it. Yeah, like I did, I did enjoy it. Just enjoyed it. It was just you know where you stood. But as time went on, it just be, it's uh, it's such an unstable t- in, in this industry. There's no security. Even security. in the UK, even in the UK, never mind over there. Such an unstable industry. Yeah. It's like it's like, it reminds me of being like, being like a salesperson who only earns off a commission. You're constantly looking for your next sale, yeah. constantly ne- next commission, next customer, and that's what it's like. Yeah. You're constantly worried about is your contract going to get binned? Yeah. Because people, well, maybe when you were there, well, yeah, it would have been when you were doing it as well. Contracts would get binned mm. just en masse. Mm-hmm. Hundreds of people would lose their jobs mm-hmm. and you wouldn't know. And then you've got hundreds of people looking for another job in CP yep. and, and, it, and it's all really clicky yep. and mates rage. Yeah, of course it is. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. It's terrible. Um, but yeah, I, I left that and I I, <laughs> I worked in London doing CP for two years. Uh, but it was that was all right. I worked for an American firm called Gavin De Becker. Oh, yeah. Um, so I worked for them for two years. Quite rigorous to get in with them, actually. Um, and it was good. We had some really good clients. It was it was a good routine, but it was hard work working for Americans for an American firm. Why is that? Just because we all know that you know they're very strict down the line, almost like robots in a way. Um, especially that they, you know, they kind of they did think that they were borderline CIA with their like headquarters and big massive this that and the other. Um, but yeah, I. I'd done it. It was the people I worked for was good. The, our UK team was really good because it was all ex guys, um, but you know it wore on you even more. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd done that for a couple of years, but yeah, and then I sort of sacked that off as well because it's hard work, man. It's hard work and clicky again, clicky and even harder when you're working for Americans. It all kind of gets onto you at one point, but you know, yeah. But I dabbled in both. Dabbled in both. Um, they're still doing all right. So loads of lads are still doing that. Uh, I think the UK scene is probably a lot more popular than the overseas scene at the minute. Um, yeah, difficult to get into there, right? It's just a lot smaller. And everyone a lot thinks smaller. they're ninjas and can get whatever jobs they want. Yeah. Because whatever. But yeah, if you land a good company like that, it's okay. Yeah. And even better if you land a good family. Yeah. But then it's the it's 
the bullshit will get you. It is, yeah. You'll get fucking it is, yeah. out. I can't, I can't deal with it, man. It really grinds on me. All the pettiness of stuff and there's backstabbing and there's this and there's that. And if you do anything wrong, people are always trying to look for that promotion. They'll stab you in the back. They'll grass on you and snitch on you. And even if it's something, you know, stupid, it doesn't need to be anything. Um, and uh, it just grinds you down. And I'm like, I can't be dealing with this anymore. So, yeah, that was one of the reasons I was like, no, nah, I'm not doing it. So what did you do after you binned that off? I've got another job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that bit. Um, no, I worked for a rescue company. Um, uh a rescue team, which was all ex, um, ex-military ex guys. Uh, they were based out in Surrey, so we used to do, um, you know, we used to work alongside the police and the fire brigade um, doing stuff like that, but we got made redundant. We had a contract, so it worked, kind of worked out quite nicely in the fact that me and George launched the cards pretty much the same month that I got made redundant. So it kind of worked out. I didn't see it coming, but we got our three months notice because of COVID, because we hadn't, we was working at Heathrow Airport, and uh, obviously no one's flying, so no one needs any sort of that assets. Um, so the company sort of got laid off for the interim, but there was like sixteen of us. Um, so, but it, you know, they they did what they had to do. Um, but it kind of allowed me more time to focus on what we were doing and building up. So, um, yeah, it was all right. It, it, it's worked out all right in the end, to be fair. You know. And what was it like starting a business in the middle of the pandemic? You fucking madman. Well. <laughs> it was it was really really weird to be honest. Uh, no, so we started the first conversation that me and George ever had about our cards was we went to a coffee shop and I used to draw. So uh, when we when I was in Afghan or you know when I was in the military still, I used to take a sketch pad, some pencils, and I used to draw stuff, people, portraits. You know, not very good, but they were all right. It kept me entertained. Um, so George messaged me and he was like, "I got an idea." Um, but I want you to draw some of the stuff for me. And I'm like, mate, I haven't picked up a pencil in six years. I'm like, you really think I'm going to be able to draw stuff? Like, as it? I was like, let's meet up. Let's go for a coffee. Because we haven't seen each other for a while anyway. Um, so we sat down and he's like, right, I want to make a deck of playing cards. I'm like, okay. I'm like, what sort of? And he's like, a UK military one. I'm like, okay. How are we going to do that then? And he's like, well, I've seen this guy. Um, it was an ex-USMC guy. Now, don't get me wrong. We haven't copied him, right? He came up with an idea where he done something fairly similar, but he used to have pinup girls like riding bombs or submarines or stuff like this. And he threw them on Kickstarter as well, but he never followed it up. Like they were really cool cards and they were really good. Completely different style, but kind of fundamentals were sort of the same. But that was in America. No one had done anything in England. So we was like, okay, so what, what are we thinking here? Well, let's do a UK military deck. And we're like, okay, done our research. Because there's... Every veteran brand has to do their research, so we didn't want to copy anyone, right? And we weren't because no one else was doing it. No cards, yeah. No cards, nothing. Not even remotely similar. So he's like, okay, let's do it. So that day, we done it. The very next day, we found an illustrator, Nick, who's our illustrator. Diamond, like, his drawing, like, we come up with these, like, Johnny Age 5 drawings, and we send them to him, and he just polishes the turd basically and makes them look amazing oh so you guys do the concept of what the card should look like yes and then you go, oh, yeah yeah okay. we don't we we design them as much as we can and we get um uh you know we get references of stuff to go on but we the general idea and the layout um we do me and george do and we send it to him and then he starts the process of doing the sketch doing the ink and doing the coloring and then as we go forward if something needs to be added or taken away then we we um, we tell him basically until we've got the finished product. Everyone's happy with it. It's cool. Stored out in the back, and then we move on to the next one. So we, it was a really quick process. I know it sounds. It took us eighteen months to do our first cup deck because you know we were both working and we didn't have a business, so we had to chip in and take money from our own and put in a lump sum from our own cash and then trickle in and drip feed it in every month to get one or two cards done a month. That was the problem with it. Um, but yeah, we we laid it out. Okay, how are we going to do it? Let's let's start with the top tier, Ace of Spades, SAS. Has to be, has to do that. All the other aces, Special Forces, then we'll move down. Paras, boot next, this, that, and the other. But then we tried to think of it as a business point that the bigger, the, the, the military viewing, so engineers, artillery, has got a much bigger viewing than you know, other people that... You're justifying, you're justifying stuff, aren't you? Before you say things. No. I can tell what you're doing. Am I? Go on. I'm going, yeah, I'm going. Go on. <laughs> because, let me hazard a guess. Go on. Well, there's only 52 cards. You can't put every single unit on a 52-card deck. No, no, 
no, and people have tried to pull me this before. They're like, oh, I thought you was going to do every card as like a unit. But I, I always say, no, we don't do that purely because two reasons. One, we couldn't have, we'd have to multiply those double pictures for each because it's like there's not enough. There isn't enough. It depends how deep you want to go. Do I want chefs in there or VMs or like how far do you go with it? Two, if we did do that or we even did manage to find 52 different regiments to put in every single card, we've just thrown away potentially four decks of cards because we've only done the face cards, which is 16, right? Oh, yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, that's right. Face cards, yeah. Yeah, so we've only done the face cards. as So the picture cards are the pictures, right? So 16 there. But then if we've done all 52, then we've thrown away the idea of trying to do extra decks. Does that kind of make sense or not? Yeah. So that's why. So we've done limited it to 16. But here's... So we wanted the bigger, the bigger regiments in there to gain more eyes because it's a business. That's what we want. We wanted, basic, to try and hit, yeah. we wanted to try and hit as many people as we could with the hope that in the future, as we start growing, um, we can then do uh, regiment-specific decks. So we could do a bootneck deck, a para reg deck with all the SQs, snipers, mortars, this, that, and the other. And it sort of spider webs out. This is the whole, I, the whole idea. So we've done the military deck, launched it, went down really well. Everyone loved it which was more to our surprise. We didn't realize that we was going to do that well with it. So it was like, okay, emergency services. How do we do the emergency services? Okay, counterterrorism police, MI5, all the Gucci units, this, that, and ever. Boom, done. Make that. So we've done this deck that we just launched three weeks ago in six months as opposed to 18 months because we had the ball rolling. We, could, we knew what we didn't want it to do. We didn't have any more problems. We'd iron out all the it's creases. the blue light deck. The blue light deck, yeah. So we launched that got everything done and again you know it's been received very very well no one's moaned about it everyone seems pretty happy with it um we still got a week left on the pre-sale but we've already done more numbers on decks sold than we did the first time around which is really cool um which lets us go on to deck three deck four trading cards and all the other shit that we got planned trading cards yeah go on um what we're gonna make almost like a military version of Pokemon cards because I think it's a really great idea. <laughs> um, and it's it hasn't been done. So trading cards, Tops trading cards, big massive company, they brought out a set of Desert Warfare trading cards in 1992, which used to have pictures of tanks, aircrafts, major generals from the US military, and God's honest truth, when they sold, they sold out of every kiosk in New York or wherever it was in an hour. Every single one. In 1992. Nothing has ever been... And you can still buy them on eBay. People still collect them. People got the whole thing. They're trying to sell a whole set on eBay for hundreds and hundreds of pounds. But nothing has ever been made since. No military-style trading card, modern day, that's got modern day units or anything like that has ever been made since then. And me and George looked at each other like, why have we not made these? Why have we not tried to make these? So we did. Um, so we pulled Nick away from doing whatever he was doing. We was like, make this. And then we was obviously really lucky to get Christian Craighead involved as well to be our number one card, which is amazing because we was like, we wanted to work with him, um, but we never knew that we could get to him because he's a big fish. Do you know what I mean? He's, no, he's on his way to wherever he's going. But we were really lucky that one of the guys in the Met Police that we'd met that helped us do the cards knew him. Uh, and, you know, the chance that we would have to talk to him, he, not even just to ask him if we can use him or him to be involved, um, we, it was a mile, million miles away. We never thought it was going to happen, um, but it did. And Well, he's been very clever, I think, in what he's doing. Yeah. Is that he, he knows, I think, he knows he's on that trajectory, yep. but he's been very, very clever in that he's making himself difficult to get to. So... Which you think is counterintuitive when arguably probably the path that he w may want to take, I don't know, it depends on what you know, it depends on what he wants to do. But it would be one to capitalize on that uh, he's a fucking legend. Like Massive. He's a fucking legend. Yeah. If he wants to you know, capitalize on that and never do a day's hard work again in his life, yeah. he can do that. Yeah. Because of you know, you know, you know the score. Um um, but so, but what he's doing is, which is sort of counterintuitive to that, he's making him difficult to get to, mm -hmm. so that 
I think when he does get a referral or someone says you need to speak to these, these guys want to speak to you, mm-hmm. it comes from people he trusts because his circle of people yeah. who are willing to not exploit him or the circle of people is very small so there's less that can exploit him. Yeah. And I think that's I think I think that's what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. Wrong. Maybe well, I mean me and me and George spoke to him on the phone. He's such a sound guy and he was he was excited for it because he used to collect football stickers back in the day when he oh, was a no, kid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as soon as you know we mentioned that this is the idea, this is what we want to do, we'd love to have your support because we didn't want to do anything. We don't want to do anything without someone's um, you know, someone saying yes, that's okay, because it's gonna bite us in the ass. We could have. We could have just said no and done it, but that's that's not the way. We can't do that. You can't get away with doing that, and we wouldn't want to do that. Um, so we we bit the bullet and we spoke to him on the phone, me and George, and we said what our plans were, um, and uh, he's like, yeah, fully on board. Um, I love it because he got excited about the fact that he used to collect the stickers and the cards as well when he was a kid, and um, you know we're going to make him shiny and this and that and the other, and he loved it, yeah. and I'm excited. I can't wait to see him or get him done, but it's going to be a long process. It's not going to be a short one, so we need, to, we need to sort of work on them and do them, but we're still having conversations with big companies about partnerships. Um, you know, It died off a bit, but it's kind of picked up a little bit more, and it's reignited the fire, so we're just going to have to wait and see what happens, but we, we'll be able to do it on our own, it would just make our lives easier, um, and I think it'd be beneficial for a big company because I think I think it's a good idea. I think it's great. I love it. Well, I think it's I think it's having an unexpected resurgence. This whole cards thing, especially yeah. the trading cards, in an in a, in a market where they probably thought it wasn't going to be very receptive receptive in the UK. Yeah. Certainly, certainly in America. So it's, it's probably still a bit of an unknown quantity, and they're still feeling it out. Yeah. Want to see how you guys are doing? You know, out of the growth, like yeah. What are you, do you get much interest from America? Yeah, loads. Which is why the the deck number three we've already I can tell you about it because we've already sort of done. We, we, deck number three is going to be the Black Ops edition, so it's special forces units from around the world. So we've got Navy SEALs, we've got Delta Force, we've got another Hereford and Paul card in there, Aussie Commandos, every everyone as many as we can fit in there. Um, we're going to do it, and we hope that we could get to the point where when we sell that, we can have outside distributors in different countries because we know how much it costs for shipping like international it's a lot of money sometimes even just for one deck of cards so it gives us extra logistical sort of um avenues to go down to to try and get this and that and the other Uh, and we've already got deck number four good to go we haven't released that one so i'm not going to tell you what it is but it's going to be really cool um but in between the decks we work on the trading cards and then as soon as we kind of hope to gain that little bit more of an international you know people talk about us in different countries then we can release the trading cards. The trading cards are going to be global. Um, like you, everyone, you know, like literally every, I think we've got 36 countries in the trading cards that we're including. But we've also turned it into a game as well, which I didn't, I wasn't planning on doing it, but one of George's friends is like a Yu-Gi-Oh Pokemon nut. And he just knows how it works, knows how to play the game. And he's like, you need to incorporate this into a, a strategic military board game as well using the trading cards because people can collect them but what if also people can play with them so we could we've got like bonus cards environment cards of where you're oh my god mate i know someone who's gonna be cream in his pants right now listening to you saying this yeah mike valance rugby heroes he is a board game that honestly he's introduced me to some amazing games oh really so the only reason i know about what you're talking that kind of stuff you're talking about with the cards and strategic games about two reasons one him and two is a guy called Stu hale introduced you to him ex Ex Power Edge Sniper, actually. Okay. And he runs Pegasus Hobbies and Games. Oh, no in way. Monmouth. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. So it's like a, a game shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. So, my, Mike Valance is going to be all yeah. over this, man. Um, You'd be like, when's the Kickstarter? Yeah. When's the Kickstarter? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. We've got, our, we've got our battle board ready, which is, um, okay. which is, uh, is actually uh, Sangin. Um, so, it's the, the 611 runs down the middle you've got the green zone one side and then the desert the other side mate mike has just spontaneously combusted listening to this i'm telling you it's gone boom <laughs> um, his head's exploded but it's going to be a long process there's a lot there's 150 there's more than that there's probably about 160 65 cards that we need to do um we've only done 12 at the minute so there's a long road ahead uh but i hope we can just chip away get a few done release a deck of cards get a little bit more attention um, like we're, we're moving in the right direction as a brand. Like we're new, we're we're small fish in this big ocean of the the veteran owned brands. Um, you know, we we had to do, do our. Do you think so? Re- yeah, I think so. I don't think you are. No, I don't think you are, because no one else is doing it, mate. 
Yeah, it's I know. Different. When yeah. It's like you, you, you've you've done it. You you know you've you've proven it. You're the only person. You're the only people doing doing it in this space. So you're not a small fish. You're the only person in the pool. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, no, but as far as everyone else, like everyone's got you know, everyone's doing their own thing. They got big followings. They got this, then they go in, and all you hear or see is you know, like the Contact Coffee, Sinita's Guild, this and that. They're all the big the big players in the ve- HR4K. All the big players in the um in the veteran owned you know business. So from us, we're still small fish compared to those because they've been going years, four years, three years. We we're only nine months in, so we're still getting there. We're doing all right. We're doing well. Um. And I'm really excited to see where we do go, uh, but it w- you know it would be nice to eventually get on their level. That's that's what we aspire to. Like when we first started this and we started the Instagram page, we'd follow all of them to see what everyone's doing. Their level in terms of what? What are you talking about? Are you talking about are you talking about money? Are you talking about no. following? Are you talking about impact? What are you talking impact about? Impact as well, yeah, impact. Like you see, um, so many people share stories of what they're doing. They share the products. They share what they're doing. Um, you know, they're so engaging because they're able to get out and they do loads of stuff with loads of other people and stuff like that. And that's kind of what we want. I know, obviously, um, Gaz has the whole community side of things and this, that and the other, which is really cool. I, I very much doubt that we would ever get to that point. But we, we have, you know, we aspire to have some something like that with the trading cards. That's where our community is going to come from, because we can have people trading we can have people talking about what they've got just because there's so many groups out there that talk about this kind of stuff. And if we can even have a remote bit of that, then we'll be really happy. But we do, we, we aspire to be as big as those guys because everyone knows them, you know, everyone knows who they are. They've all got a good reputation. Um, so we just, we just hope that we can move ourselves and build up to be on their level. Yeah. I think you'd be surprised, mate, at just how big a reach you're having. Yeah, I'm telling you. I don't know. But, um, Maybe Gaz I'm blind is to running, it. When Gaz is different. Gaz is running a cult. Now he would, <laughs> he would not agree with me. He would not agree with me. Gaz is a cult leader. Yeah. He probably doesn't want to be. But he is running a cult. So, but I mean that kind of, you know, yeah, the communities I think aspire to have behind you is what carries brands, right? But it, yeah. it'll come organically. It'll yeah. come organically. Yeah. And um, what's good with you as well? You've got, you, you've got immediately got that international appeal yeah. immediately it's not wholly british military at the moment I don't think it is especially if you get the interest from the, on the states no you know? no we get we we sell decks everywhere australia america um which is really cool but we've i like to think now we've hit the uk we've done the military we've done the emergency services so i don't think anyone would be willing to come in and try and copycat that because they'd have a hard time trying to do something that's different if that kind of makes sense We've already hit hit the UK, done covered all basis. That what you could do. I don't see what you would do um, if you were going to try and do something that's different to us in a card sense. Mm. Um, so that's why we're moving away and starting to do the international stuff. Almost like we've slowly taken over the UK and we've done that. We're happy with that. There's room for extras there. Like I said, the more we grow, the more we can come back to the UK and then start doing regiment specific decks with like SQs in there and making cool illustrations of, you know, snipers and mortars and anti-tanks and this, that and the other, and then sort of venturing out. Um, and even for the emergency services, doing a police-only deck, paramedics, fire brigade, yeah. you know, as long as the demand's there, because, you know, it's a lot of time and effort that goes into it to make them. Do you incorporate, are there any uh, personal stories incorporated to any of the illustrations on your cards? Yes. One, one that stands out mega in my mind is, on the first deck is the, um, the SRR picture, which um, is the the undercover race? Oh, you I wish ever, I'd, I you ever got the, a deck? I gave, deck. <laughs> I gave it to Mick Taylor, didn't I? I didn't even bring one with me because I knew you had one. I gave, him, I gave him the deck yeah. to have a look at. So you seen these guys look at it? Goes, I could just see the, the glee on his face. Have the pack, mate. I'll get another pack. Have yeah. the pack. Uh, so you, you should have, have told me. I would have bought another oh, one with you. Um, yeah. But yeah, so the the SRR one is um, is is really cool because without giving too much away or going into any. Um, one of one of the lads that I served with on Herrick 7, so the very first tour, um, I won't name any names, but he's a really cool guy. Anyway, when we come back in 2008, he just disappeared for like six years. Disappeared, went off the face of the earth. No one saw him. And then I saw him uh, seven or eight years later in Tesco's, around my way, in his <laughs> Sparky outfit. So I know he used to be a Sparky, and I saw him in his Sparky outfit. And I was like, where the hell did you go? He's like, oh, I went SRR. I'm like, oh, shit. 
and he and he was talking about it and this that, and the other and he had a couple of pictures on his phone that he had saved and he was he looked the part right he looked the part he had fully embedded in to the afghan lifestyle and he looked the part and some of the you know very very little story that he told me was the inspiration behind that card where you've got the guy full dish dash you know this that, and the other full shebang with an M4 underneath and this, that, and the other operating around these small little villages. So that was the inspiration. But that is about as close to a real-life person that we've probably got on there, to be honest. Like, we've had help to put um, a lot of the cards together, whether they're from friends in different organizations that I've rung up and said, would you mind having a look at this? We didn't want to make it so real that it's given anything away, kit-wise or anything like that, but enough for people to look at them and go, ah... Oh, you know, that's not made up. That's, that, that's, you know, that could actually happen or this, that, any other, or the drills or the positions of, you know, there or thereabouts. And it's the same with the police one. We had a lot of help from the guys in the Met. Um, you know, they, they showed us stuff and this, that, and the other and allowed us to sort of maneuver them into positions and allowed us to get them right so we could, um, we could make the picture as best as we could. Because we didn't want to just cuff everything because then it, you know, people wouldn't have any relevance to it. Whereas people see it. And they can they can relate to it and be like, yeah, that's real, or yeah, that's how we do that, and that's how we do that, and it makes it just that little bit better, which I think we've achieved, and we're going to do it in the next deck as well because we've got we've got some people helping us in that deck as well, which I'm really excited about. Oh, good. Have you um, what what uh, lunacy requests have you had for decks? I bet you've had some mental requests for decks. Yeah, some some bloke wanted us to make a. I don't. If, go on. Like a Northern Ireland style. Um, I think you're going to talk about the combat cigars request, eh? No. <laughs> How is that, you're by the way? Sling me under the vest. You need to no, talk, talk about, about it. Okay. Um, so, no, no, no. Um, we've had guys ask um, for chef cards that someone wants to be. Are you going to put a chef in the. Yeah, I know. That's exactly what I kind of. Like, they wanted one of the cards to be like a, a combat chef, like oh, a right, chef right, on right, ops. Right, yeah. um, and I was like, no, sorry, we haven't got any space this time around. Um, and uh, someone wanted like a deck of Northern Ireland, um, but a certain very specific regiment that went out there. I couldn't, it was a long, long message from someone who was really, really keen <laughs> and started naming names and regiments and everything like that down to the T. And it kind of went over my head. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so I was like, okay, maybe not this time. Sent me loads of pictures of him in Northern Ireland and stuff. I'm like, okay. I appreciate it, but it's just not our type at the minute. Um, but other than that, it's 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 not been too bad. We get the general, you know, this deck and that deck, which we've already a lot of people that come to us with ideas we've already thought about, which is good. That means we're thinking about something the right way of what the customer wants. Um, but it's just a matter of time, money, and effort to just make sure that we can justify doing it. Um, you need a bigger team. No, I, I mean, yeah, we we looking we. Nick, our illustrator, he's very proud of what he does. And right, he should be, because his artwork is insane. Yeah, and I'm like, Nick, can you, do you know anyone that can maybe help you out? And he's like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm like, okay, all right. I don't want to piss you off. Because anyway. he works for big companies in like LA and London. He does all the illustrations for big, big firms and sort of works on us in the meantime. Um, and I was like, surely you can just get someone to sort of mimic your style. He's like, nope, don't know anyone. Right. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I see where this. Okay, I see where this is going. All right, I won't answer again. It's you good can do though. It. He's proud of what he's doing. It's yeah, good. no, he's cool. Got he's me. cool. Uh, he loves it as well because it's different to him. He does like big brandings and logos and this, that, and the other. So, getting him to, you know, draw three counterterrorism guys doing a raid on a London flat on a suicide bomber is right up his alley because he's never done that before. So, um, yeah, he loves he loves what we come out with, and he he's slowly putting his input in as well. Like he's a full blown civvy, no military experience, nothing. So when we first started off, he was drawing like, you know, sometimes we'd have to get references of weapons and stuff like that. But maybe some of the weapons had BFAs on because they were the clearest picture to have. But he draw the BFA on, on uh, like two Hereford guys going into a. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, no, no, take the BFA off. But he's slowly learning now what needs to go in and how we put the picture together which is brilliant for us because it's less work for us. We say this is what we want and then sometimes he just does it. He just does it. And we sit back and watch him draw and then we're like, yep, good to go. Tick it off. Let's move on to the next one. So, yeah, it's good. It's fun. Have you thought about, or has anyone approached you about product placement into any of the cards? Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know. We'll try and work on it. 
Like I did, I think um, I did speak to Luke and Nick uh, from Contact Coffee. Like I try and get something in there because you know we get on with those guys. I think they're so sound. I was like maybe we could stick like a a, a Contact Coffee mug in there or something in there. But um, yeah, no, we've spoken to a few lads and we, I'd do it 100. percent i will do it in a heartbeat. I wouldn't charge anything either. I'd just do it for the crack because I think it'd be funny. Because you're too nice. I'm too nice. <laughs> That's the problem because I'm too nice. Do you want to be in my car? Yeah, do it. Yeah, just give me it. I'll put it in there. Don't worry about it. I don't want money. <laughs> yeah. But it's all fun and games. No, it's good, mate. It's mega. I, I mean, it's a great... It's like, it's a great brand. It's just nice. It's, um... It's nice when un- something unexpected comes up and and and, and is not... It's, 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 it's veteran owned, yeah. but it's not doing something other people have done. Yeah, and that was a big important thing for us. We'd done a lot of research because I didn't want to be that guy. I didn't want to be that guy if someone had already done it that we tried to impersonate or knock them off in any way uh but i feel it's so far out the box that n- no one would do it really because when he came to me i was like what playing cards but then i thought about it and i was fully invested i was like the number one invested guy into it i was like yes let's do it let's do it let's do it but then it's so funny now that we're at that point where we've got two decks out and this and even people ask what do you do for a living I say I own a playing card company. Like what? I'm like I know. That's what everyone says. <laughs> <laughs> what like and everyone does this. What like playing cards? I'm like yeah, yeah playing yeah, cards. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're like, how? What do you print them? I'm like no, we just make them. They're like, well, what kind? I'm like emergency services, military. Um, and they're like, oh, but they want to see them straight on Instagram. What's this? Oh, they're amazing. Follow done. Perfect. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. It's uh, but it's yeah. I love the uniqueness of it, which makes me excited moving forward. So, um, are you surprised at where you're at after having yeah, left? Yeah. And, um, and now yeah, like successful? a lot, of, yeah, a lot of guys, like I know, a lot of guys have a hard time, don't they, when they leave the military? They struggle, struggle to find themselves, struggle to fit in. Um, I suppose I've been really lucky that I've never felt like that. I've kind of just, because again, I'm, I'm too laid back for my own good. I don't let things try and stress me out too much, no matter how bad it gets. Um, so I left. And I walked into the private security um, and I kind of just followed it in. I didn't try and push it in any direction that it was going to stop me. I just I just went with it. And that's exactly what I've been doing. I've just go with things and it seems to just help, you know. Uh, I think a lot of guys get stressed about stuff and it can really play on you and, and sort of mess the mind up a bit. And um, I don't think it needs to happen. I think, um, you know, I just I just sit there and chill out the condor moment you know things do get a little bit stressed i just sit back have a tab good to go again um just roll with it you know and it's worked out for me it's worked out fine here we are i'm not saying i'm a complete baller and you know this or any other but we're doing all right we've got we're in a good spot which is better than a lot of people over the last 18 months um like you said we we we, we launched it in and around the pandemic um uh, but it's it was a unique thing where people could still buy it and they could play with them at home, which is what a lot of people did. Um, so it never really impacted us that much. Um, but I, you know, I get it. A lot of people have had a hard time. We, it's, we've had it. We've had hard times. But again, just take a chill pill, focus on the bigger picture, and we're good to go. No, no need to get stressed over it. It's all good. Maga, on that note, mate, we're gonna have to knock on the head. Cool. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Jen. You know I love. You know I love. I bought into the uh, the the crowdfunder uh, yes. that first pack. Got yeah, pack through. I was like, yes. Yeah. And then fucking Mick Taylor took them last week. Don't worry, I'll sort you on um, it. No, no, I'll get another pack, mate. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's just mega. It's mega prime, mate. It's good to see. It's good to see people in general being fucking successful with stuff, especially unexpectedly. It's even better when it's their ex-military. Thank you. you know? um, Appreciate it. And you're not a knob. Which is also like well, a, well, yeah. No, well, I try. I try my very best not to be a knob. I don't want to tarnish everyone's business in an hour and a half. So no, it's all good. Thank you. Um, good luck with the event coming up soon. Yes. And uh, good luck with anything, mate. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Oh, hang on. Now, what the fuck am I talking about? What's the website? Oh, www.quickdrawcardco.com. Um, our blue light edition decks are on pre-sale until. This weekend, the 31st, um, they go off. So if you want your first edition deck, head over. Do you get them cheaper? Yes, you do. Yeah, you do get them cheaper. Yeah, we're doing a a little bit of money knocked off, especially the T-shirts and the prints as well. But um, this weekend, to get the first edition decks, they won't be printed again. So with a ribbon on top. 
Um, um, so there you go. If you got if anyone's got a friend in Blue Light Services, maybe you're not in the Blue Light Services. You got a friend in it. Get them a gift. There you go. There you go. But you got to get it before the weekend. Okay. There you go. Uh, oh shit! It's because it's on Sunday. Does it? Yeah. Oh well. Oh, will it still be on sale on Sunday? They will. Uh, yeah. All right. We'll extend it till Sunday night. <laughs> Wait, you're too nice. Yeah, so they, uh, they go, too nice. There you go. I'll just give you an extra day. Don't worry about it. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Sweet. Funny. Right. Um, that's it. Perfect. Let's do it again. All good.